we're going to do ten questions uh, in a minute, friend. But uh, first, uh, I do enjoy watching this on YouTube. Uh, three blokes in a pub. Unfortunately, we've ended up with Graham Hughes. Jason couldn't make it. No, and do stand up so everyone can have a look at you in your nice T-shirt. Hey. Hey. Wow, when we started the Free Blokes of the Book podcast three months ago, we had no idea just how epic it was going to be. We just have to thank anyone here who contributed to the crowdfunder, which allowed us to go all around Britain, also to Geneva, to Gibraltar, to Brussels, to, to uh, uh, Belfast, and to Dublin. We learned so much. So yeah, I just want to say something about your class bidding system. One question. Would anyone take Jacob rees Smog seriously if he had a bummy accent? <laughs> Absolutely not. The thing is, when we started the podcast, we had this idea that we wanted to get people to listen to people who knew what they were talking about. But it became quite clear after about three episodes that we had kind of run out of things that we knew about ourselves. So it was important for us to get out there and start asking the experts. So we got out of our area, we, went, we left home, and we went and spoke to people. We spoke to people in Geneva, and what they told us was effectively, no matter how bad you think Brexit is going to be, it's going to be even worse. And I'll tell you this, when we came out of the organization that we spoke to in Geneva, that we can't say what the name of the organization is, but you can probably work it out. <laughs> Jason had tears in his eyes. And he said, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know it was gonna be this bad. So what they told us was just absolutely nothing short of apocalyptic for this country. And they told us this like, like we should already know and it should already be in the public discourse. They said, everyone's going to sue you. And we said, what? You know, every company that has invested one pound in your country in the last 40 years because you're part of Europe is going to want their money back for investing in you because you're part of Europe and that being an entryway to the whole of Europe. Do you think Nissan and Sunderland want to pay 10% on parts coming in and then a 10% tariff on the cars going out? You think their customers are going to pay an extra 20%? Nissan are going to go to the Japanese government and say, Oi, we had an agreement and the British reneged on that agreement and we want our money back. <laughs> Even if we won every case, the cost of the lawyers, the court time, and they can sue us in four different courts that I know of. There might be more. Our own courts, the WTO, the World Bank, and if it gets to this level, also The Hague. I'll talk about this because of the Good Friday agreement. We went over to Belfast and we actually spoke to someone, one of the guys who helped write the Good Friday agreement. What he told us was this. There was no concept at the time that we would never be that we would pull out of the EU. The Good Friday agreement was written because Ireland and the UK joined the EU as it was in the EEC. In 1973, we joined on the same day. We joined together and we always backed each other up in, in Europe. We always did. And it was just taken for granted that would re we would remain in the EU. And I have to stress how important the Good Friday Agreement is. It's the most important treaty that Britain has signed since the end of World War II. Thousands of people died in the Troubles. Thousands. And the Good Friday Agreement signalled an end to all that. And here's the next problem they brought up in Geneva. They said, who's going to trust you again? You're reneging on 759 international treaties. You're just walking out the room. You've got these agreements and you're saying, well, I don't want to be part of this anymore. Do you think that's not going to come back? and bite you? Last week we saw in Bloomsburg, they were reporting on these things called the government, uh, sorry, this thing called the government procurement agreement. No one's ever heard of this. I don't think Theresa May's even heard of this. 
The Government Procurement Agreement is an agreement between 46 countries in the world to allow our companies to put out a bid on tenders for American infrastructure work paid for by the American government, paid for by the American taxpayer. They can't give American companies preferential treatments over British companies, or Australian companies, or French companies, or any of the 46 signatories of that agreement. We're out. We're leaving the EU. We're only part of that agreement because we're part of the EU. To get back in, we don't need 52%. We need 100%. We need every single one of those 46 countries to say yes. And one of them has already said no. Do you know what that country is? US. Anyone? US. Moldova! <laughs> Why? Why is little Moldova sandwiched between Ukraine and Romania? Why has Moldova said no? Yes. We refused a government minister a visa to come visit the country last year to find out more about what's going to happen in post-Brexit Britain. Great. Take back control, they said. Take back control. And it gets worse. The agri-foods industry in the United Kingdom, the guys in Geneva said it had between 18 months and two years of life left in it. And if you think about it, just logically, but don't, Forget about the propaganda, forget about what who said and they said and they said. Just think about this for a moment. What's going to happen when the farmers don't have the subsidies that they get from the EU? Serial farmers are lucky to make a few grand a year profit. Okay? They need those subsidies to keep growing their food that they grow. Yes, the EU is a protectionist club. They're protecting us. <laughs> Every nation in the world tries to protect its own. They do, and then these large group entities of, of trade entities like the, the West African Equiwars, like CAVICOM in the Caribbean, like NAFTA in uh, North America between Mexico, the US, and Canada, they all try and protect themselves to some degree. And this is why we protect our farmers, because newsflash, it's cheaper to make stuff in America. It's cheaper to build stuff in China. If you don't know this, you don't know the first thing about trade. But we are on the doorstep at the moment of 27 of the countries that the IMF say are advanced economies. There's only 35 in the world. In the entire world, there's only 35. And 27 of them are in Europe. That leaves eight. The rest of the world, 150 odd countries, the rest of the world, eight of them, advanced economies. And the EU has comprehensive trade deals with four of them that we're part of at the moment. We have comprehensive trade deals with the EU and those four countries. And we also have association agreements and, and trade deals to do with commodities that aren't comprehensive, but we do have deals with over a third of the wealth of the world. Because let's not, be, let's not kid ourselves here, right? You've got the wealth of the world is a quarter of America, it's a quarter of the EU, it's a quarter China and Japan and India. The rest of the world is in that final quarter. And the idea that we're going to get these great new trade deals with these countries, the rest of the world that Jacob B. Small keeps lying to people about because he doesn't know the rest of the world, he's never been there, he's never seen it, he doesn't know what he's talking about. The rest of the world? Even if we could get a trade deal with them that was better than what we've got now, it wouldn't replace what we've got now. We won't get as good a trade deal with the EU, and we can't legally get a good trade a good as trade deal with Canada, South Korea, Japan, or Singapore. Because as part of their free trade deal with the EU, they say they can't give a better deal to anybody else. We are the first country in human history to put trade sanctions on itself? <laughs> Seriously, are we mental? This is the things that they say, oh, we're going to put trade sanctions on Iran, they'll be naughty, uh, Russia's but it's done, it invaded this other country, and the next day we're going to put trade sanctions on them. What are trade sanctions? When they try and sell things, it costs more for the countries buying off them. 
That's what we're doing. 10% on cars is 40% on land. It's not stuck on farmers. 40% tariff, WTO, on land. When we said at the government, at the, at the organisation we saw in Geneva, I can't say the name of, they said, you are basically resetting to zero. I mean, you are, you are going from this point where you've negotiated over 40 years and longer to get these tariffs down as low as you possibly can so you can sell your stuff to loads of countries that have got loads of wealth. And I said, well, you know, but Jacob Rees Mark says you can get these great trade deals. And they looked at me like I was a, an idiot. <laughs> he said, listen, you put the GDP of every country in Africa together, it is half. There's 54 countries in Africa. So let's stress this point. I can't stress this point enough. 54 countries in Africa. This is all, in a year, all the diamonds sold from Botswana, all the gold from South Africa, all of the oil from Angola, and the only other 51 countries put together, their entire output, is about half that of France's. Half. But we'll build without the Commonwealth. The sun never set on the British Empire. We'll have Empire 2.0. The Commonwealth is amazingly poor. I think people will be quite disturbed at the fact that we're the richest country in the Commonwealth, India is the second richest country, and they have a population of over a billion. That tells you a lot. The next countries, Canada, Australia, Australia's got a population of 23 million people. It's a small country. People talk about New Zealand, I'm gonna get a new trade deal with New Zealand. New Zealand has a population of 4.7 million, it's half that of London alone. If you take those 48 remaining countries, after you've taken Britain, India, Canada, and Australia out of the equation, 48 of the countries of the Commonwealth, and it includes quite rich countries like Singapore and like Malaysia, it is less than the GDP of Germany. Just that one country. We need to understand that we are on the doorstep of our customers. Because in this country, we only produce stuff for wealthy people, for affluent people, for people who have a bit of money to spend on the stuff that we make. We don't make cheap food. We don't make cheap clothing. We don't make cheap mobile phones. These are the things that people want in developing nations. We do not make them. And even if we did, we would price it out just because the manufacturing costs would be so high in this country. We would price it out because the transportation would be so much in this country. So here we are in this situation where Jason and I on the Free Blokes podcast are going around talking to these experts and every week we just get more and more depressed. This week we talked to someone from one of the major, um, oh God, I, one of the things is we, we do interviews with people and they're not hard to say who they are, what they, who they work for, but uh, they work for a major pharmaceutical company. And they're very high up in this particular company. And they said, until this summer, the British government was seriously considering having our own regulations for medicine. Because we we're going to stand on our own two feet. We don't need regulations from some other country to tell us what's safe and not. So we were going to retest all the drugs coming into the country. You imagine all the standstill that we're going to have in Bre after Brexit Day next year if it goes ahead. All those lorries parked all the way back through Kent all the way back to the M25. You're going to have the same on the other side of the border, on the other side of the, of the channel in, in, in France. You're going to have that in Belgium. You're going to have that in, in Holland. Although they are a bit, bit, bit better prepared than us. There's going to be disruption to the medicines coming in anyway, and they want to test them. Testing medicines is really, really difficult. It's an ongoing thing. You don't just test it once and go, hey, it works, let's just keep making it. You have to test every batch to make sure it's not going to kill someone. If we did that ourselves, it would mean that children who are sick in this country would not get their medicine next April. And the government said to the European Union, this is what we're going to do. And the European looked at them like they were absolute psychopathic lunatics. Because only a psychopath would say something like that. Oh, well, you know, we're gonna hold our sick kids hostage and you have to do what we say. Or, or... So when those first tranche of government preparedness notices came out over the summer, there was a huge sigh of relief in the pharmaceutical industry, in the NHS, doctors, nurses, everything, where the government said they weren't gonna have their own 
regulations, but the fact they thought about it is terrifying. And here's something else. The person that we spoke to, they said, my daughter is, is, is sick, and I've bought myself a freezer so I can keep medicine in there after we pull out. Now my dad's got dementia. He takes about seven or eight pills a day. He doesn't know he's taking them, but we have to make him take them. He's also got heart problems. The government's own literature says that we should stockpile medicines. We can't. He's on a repeat prescription. He gets what he needs each month. How do we stockpile it? It just doesn't work in a system where you have an NHS. Maybe you all have private healthcare. Maybe that's the plan. The way it was described to us in Geneva is that the British government is doing the most complex thing ever attempted in the history of the world. And they are doing it at the worst possible time. As, as Andrew as, uh, mentioned, we've got the far right movements coming up all over Europe. We've got Putin on one side who wants the destabilization of the Western world. We've got Trump on the other who wants the destabilization of the Western world. Europe is in the middle. We need to work together because if we don't, the instability of a first world country like Great Britain, the fifth biggest economy in the world, failing will cause war. And we can't, we can't mess about with this. You look at Somalia, that's one failed state in the whole of Africa, and the trouble that that caused to world shipping. Everything you buy costs more now. I think you don't realize it, but it does. Because all the ships coming from China, coming from India, coming from Singapore, coming from Australia, have to go through the pilot. So they have to pay extra insurance, they have to pay extra for security on board those ships. And those costs are passed on to you, the consumer. That's one state. That's what happens when it fails. You get pirates, there's no, there's no navy, there's no coast guard to stop them. Britain, as a failed state on the edge of Europe, will drag the rest of Europe down with us. We're like a, a suicide bomber to our home, to Europe. The country, the, the, the continent of, of, of all of us, pretty much, who are here tonight. The continent of Shakespeare, We've got the Shakespeare plays. They're not all set in Little England. Okay, so I feel like I've depressed you enough. Now I'm gonna just give you some hope because I want to give you some homework to do because I know you know Brexit's awful, and I know I'm, I'm, in some ways I'm preaching to the choir, but I just want you to know how, how quite how awful it really is. Um, Jason and I are working on. Um, a few campaigns. We've got one which is called the Are You Sure campaign, which is targeting soft leavers on Facebook. Uh, it's going to be a uh, short advert where it just says a, a particular thing about the NHS or jobs or whatever, and then it says Brexit. Is your job safe? Are you sure? Is the will the NHS survive? Are you sure? The idea being, we're not, we're not from, you know, people over the head facts. We're not telling them that they must think the EU is amazing, but just to feed into that little thing in people's heads that go, is this, is this really the, the, the right idea? The second thing we're doing is a LinkedIn campaign to small and medium enterprises because it was something that we've taken away from our meetings in Geneva and Brussels and Gibraltar. Oh, I didn't tell you, our meeting in Gibraltar, we were invited over there by the government of Gibraltar. And they said to us, we don't know what we're going to do with our rubbish. <laughs> and I said, what? They went, rubbish. We, we used to have an incinerator when the border was closed in the 80s, but we got rid of that years ago. We don't have the space, we don't have any landfill, and we don't have the container, uh, we don't have a port that we can get rid of trash on. It all goes out to Spain at the moment. And I'm like, so what are you going to do with it? And they go, we have no idea. But then the British government has no idea about any of this stuff because it's so complex and no one had the opportunity to step back. I mean, there were a few experts who, who knew a lot about a particular facets of this whole thing. But there's no one who stepped back and went, oh my God, this is so complex. This is ridiculous. And one of the things they said in, um, in, our, in our meetings, I think it was in Brussels, they said you need to get small and medium enterprises to raise their voices. Next time you go in, I went to uh, my girlfriend's deaf and, and we went to the audiologist uh, last week and she asked the audiologist where the batteries are going to come from. 
after March next year. Because she goes through batteries like you know every day in her, in her hearing aids. And uh, the other day I just said, oh, well, you know, we, we get them from the usual supplier. I said, yeah, but where does it come from? Have you read the government's preparedness notices? <laughs> no. I'm looking at them going, this is your business. How can you not know if you're going to still be able to get the stuff that you need to continue trading? But we've got this attitude in the UK. And this comes to the, uh, the third campaign that Jason and I are doing, um, which is called the um, We Need to Talk About Brexit campaign. Because, God, it's embarrassing, isn't it? Oh, it's like telling someone that you're gay or that you're, you're I don't know, that you, you know, that you're not a Christian anymore or something. It's just, it's just one of those things. It's, it's, it takes a lot of courage to just come out and say, listen, slightly racist uncle who voted leave. I think you're wrong and this is why. We're British and we don't like doing that. We don't like making a scene. But we're running out of time, guys. We've got to talk about Brexit and not just amongst ourselves. So please, do the stuff you're doing. What you're doing at the moment is great. You are part of a movement. I'm sure a lot of you went on the march in London a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Thank you. You are supporting the people's vote, which is the, the way out of this. That is the government's get out of jail free card. It's our get out of jail free card. Uh, but also, please, 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 write to your MPs every day. Write to your MPs. Just annoy them as much as humanly possible. Because they're like the rest of us, anything for a quiet life. But most of all, please, talk to your friends, your family, your colleagues who voted to leave. And please tell them some of the stuff that you've learned over the last two years. I didn't know any of this stuff two years ago, but apparently I had enough um, acumen and knowledge about this situation to make a decision on it, which is what we did. I didn't know. I was, I've got a debate in politics. I was like, I don't know if we should stay in the EU or not. I've never really looked into it. When you go on the, um, you know, when you sign up to Tinder, it gives a, a whole list of terms and conditions. I didn't get that when I voted. If you do that in Ireland, by the way, where they have referendum quite a lot, they give you, they give out everyone who's going to vote all the information about it. We never got that. We just got propaganda. So we need to combat that propaganda. And um, I'm going to sit down and I've talked, I've talked far too much. I don't know what time we're going in. Um, when you talk to leavers, you don't necessarily have to fat them until they fart, okay? <laughs> A better way of doing it is just imagine in your head that they've fallen in love with a wrongdoer. Okay? So don't necessarily go in and go, hey, the EU's great, because they'll, that's a bit like going, why didn't you dump your girlfriend and go out with this girl instead, who they would then find attractive. No, just sit them down and quietly and calmly, as you would if you wanted to tell your friends that, you know, their partner probably wasn't the best choice. Be very diplomatic, very loving, and understand that the Brexit vote was a crime of passion. It was an emotional response to a situation. There was no logic in it. And if you try and hammer them with facts, it just won't work. Just tell them your concerns. Tell them that you want to just not be worried, not be kept up at night sick with worry about what's gonna happen next year. Because we don't know, the government don't know, the EU don't know, nobody knows where this country is going to be in April. Is this real? Is this real life? Is this actually happening? I think if a lot of us didn't know if our job was secure for next April, we'd be a bit concerned. I think if a lot of us knew if our relationship wasn't secure next April, we'd be a bit concerned. This goes above and beyond all of that. And when you look at how many people's lives are absolutely critically entwined with us being a member of the European Union, one way or the other, whether it's trade, commodities, medicine, just, you know, this is not about going on holiday. It's about more than that. It's about who we are as people. So please, make your voices heard. Don't leave here and just go, oh, that was great, you know, that was fun listening to Ray and Michael and Terry and, and, and Andrew and, and, uh, and Maddie speak. You can change things yourself. 
but just keep fighting because no one has ever had to fight anything like this before, especially not in this country. And we don't know what is going to work, so we just have to keep fighting. But I'll tell you what won't work, and that's doing nothing. Thank you.